Okay, might as well get started now. I think there might be still a few people joining. Um, we'll just kick off with the, the basic housekeeping, I guess, to start with. So there's Q&A and there's chat attached to the webinar. If you've got a question that you'd like to ask as we're going through, it'd be ideal if you could put it into the Q&A and then we'll try and pick those up as we move through the session um, and answer them as we go. Um, or if there's anything you want to kind of post more widely to, to the audience, as it were, then you can put that into the chat and we'll try and extract any questions from there. We do have to go in there, but, but ideally, please use the Q&A slot on the webinar section. Um, in terms of what we're going through today, it's all about driver diagrams and PDSA cycles. So hopefully you can see the screen that I've shared, um, just the basic description of kind of agenda for the session. And work through these topics, um, try and go through them in a bit more detail than you might have done on, say, the Getting Started webinar, um, and delve into some of the, the extra kind of features around those. I'm keen to make it kind of interactive in the sense of if you do have questions to go through, please do put them in the Q&A, as I said, and we'll try and pick them up as we go through the session. Okay, let's, let's get started. So yeah, first of all, overview of driver diagrams. I guess the first thing is making sure that you understand kind of where the driver diagrams are in LifeQI, kind of how to get them before we even start building one. Basically the driver diagrams and the PDSAs, a bit like the, the run charts, control charts are all in the project area of the platform. So if you don't have a project yet, you'll need to create one to get to those tools. Or if you do already have a project and you've just say charted it, then you need to go into that project um, to, to work on those tools. If you've already got a project, you're going to see it on your start page down here in your project section. Um, but if you're kind of brand new to this and you don't have one, then you go into projects on the main menu on the left hand side. And then up here, start a new project and it will take you through kind of the wizard, the setup process to, to get that project created. And then you'll see it, see it appear in your list here. What I'm gonna do to start with is go into a project we've already got and kind of look at a driver diagram that's already been built. Um, it's quite a useful way of understanding sort of the functionality. So just to ground you within the project space, we're in it now, um, different pages along the top here make up the project and we need to go into the driver diagram page um, to, to be able to work on that. You can get to it either from this tab at the top here, or when you are on the general page, you've got the glance panel, and this just gives you a little preview of what the driver diagram looks like, and there's a kind of a link there as well. So it's just kind of either place you can kind of link and get into your driver diagram. As I said, this project's already been set up, it's fairly well populated, so we've already got a driver diagram. It's kind of useful to start with a, with a populated one, basically. Um, yeah, I guess starting with kind of the basics, obviously it goes kind of left to right as most but not all driver diagrams do. And we've got right through from aim, primary drivers, secondary drivers through to change ideas as well. So kind of including all kind of four columns as it were in the life QI driver diagram. Um, some people want kind of extra columns as it were, they want to be able to have, you know, maybe tertiary drivers, things like that, or they want to be able to have multiple driver diagrams on the page. Um, life QI doesn't support that at the moment, although there are plans to allow that um, in the future. But at the moment, the, the number of columns, as it were, is kind of fixed to the four that we've got on the page here, basically. Um, another obvious thing is this one's got plenty of different colors on it. Um, you're able to kind of set up and define what those colors mean and then add them to the driver diagram. You can do this in all sorts of different ways and for different reasons. If I scroll down to the bottom, you can see the little legend down here, the, or the key, and we've set these colors up to represent kind of a, an in-progress, um, sort of, you know, in-progress delayed, in-progress on track, has it been completed sort of thing. But people do this in all sorts of different ways. Sometimes it's more of a rag rating type theme. Sometimes it might be, you just want to color each sort of primary driver and its associated secondary and change ideas all one color and then the next set all one color just to help you kind of visually distinguish them or there might be different themes of, of sort of drivers so some might be to do with process or training or um, all sorts of different sort of thing, clinical interventions or whatever it might be you can color code them as makes sense to you um, if i just show you now how you'd go about creating or editing those um, I guess the first thing to note here is you have to click that edit button in the top right hand corner above the driver diagram before you can make changes to it. So you can't accidentally mess it up. You've got to click edit. It now becomes editable. As we can see, some of this has changed. Um, and I'll come back to those features in a minute, but if we just scroll back down to where the colors were underneath, we've then got what has appeared here is this manage colors button. And click on that, this pops up. So on the left here, pick a color. So these are all the different colors that I can, I can choose from basically. 
And then once I've selected them, they appear here and I can add a label. So I'm just going to add another one here. Not very inspiring, but I can just name this color as it were. Um, so yeah, if there's any that you do want to use on the driver diagram, select them, give them a label, click done, and see they'll now appear down here in the legend area. And then when I go back up to my driver diagram, if I want to make some changes, you can see this kind of white button, basically. If I click on that, it'll give me the different options that I have available. So I can now set this one to yellow um, and, and apply that to the other colors as well. On the subject of colors, you can also change the color of the text. So if you happen to have picked, you can see here we've got blue box and we've got white text and we've got black text. If you pick a color that doesn't really work with the standard black text, then you can switch it. Or rather, I think the standard text is white. You can switch it and make it black text. So just by clicking the little, uh, the two little A buttons, that will toggle the color of the text. Basically, so if you click on that, you can see that's now gone to, to white text. So you'll have to kind of play around with those colors to make it as, as legible as possible, basically. Um, I guess while we're looking at this, the other symbol we've got on here is the little rubbish bin. So if you want to delete that driver, you simply click on that delete button and it will, it will remove it. If it does have any, uh, if you like any children attached to it, so in this case, any change ideas, and I think that hangs off it to the right, it will warn you that you're about to delete a driver that has something attached to it. And what it would then do in this case is it would leave this change idea. It wouldn't delete it. It would leave it kind of hanging on the page there. And it'd be up to you to kind of reconnect it into the driver diagram or, or choose to delete it separately, if that was the case. Um, something else to look at while we're here, when we're in edit mode, is we've got these little kind of up down arrows that have appeared here. So these allow me to drag and drop the, the drivers around. So if I actually want to change the order of this one and I want to move it down beneath this blue box, I would do that. So it's changed the order of those two and see live QI has kind of redrawn the line. So I've got to be careful here because if I drag and drop them around too much, I might end up with kind of this mishmash of lines on the right hand side. So sometimes rearranging these, you might want to rearrange the change ideas as well. So you don't end up with, with kind of lines all over the place. But for the more simple, just sort of swapping the order of these around, that drag and drop up and down will work nicely. Uh, what you can't do is you can't drag and drop left to right. So I can't make this secondary driver a change idea. It's got to stay within its column, but I can drag and drop it up and down, basically. So and this is part of the kind of the manual ordering version of the driver diagram. I come all the way back up here. Over on the left, you can, if I click on this, it will switch it to automatic ordering. And in that sense, LifeQI will take care of the ordering of your drivers and the change ideas, and it will try and make sense of it so you don't end up with the sort of spaghetti junction, you don't end up with lines all over the place, it will try and move them around, to have as few lines crossing as possible. But a lot of people like it in a specific order, um, and so that's why we've kind of got the, the manual ordering as well. Uh, Kerry, got, no, you've got your hand up, you want to chip in with that? I think uh, you just not. covered the question. There was, but I think you You're just right. covered it, so that's fine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> not to worry. I'll carry on for now then. Um, okay, so what else have we got? We've got moving them around, um, I guess. So, yeah, we obviously, we've already got this driver diagram that's already been built, so I haven't showed you building this one from scratch. But if I've got one and I want to make some edits to it, as well as dragging the order around, you can obviously change uh, what's written in all of these boxes. So if I don't want to, you know, just want to make that change the name of that, uh, just addressing, for example, you can just click into any of these boxes and start to make changes to those. Uh, what you notice as I've clicked into this one is there's a character limit, so 250 characters per, per box, basically. So you can write a quite a reasonable amount in them, but there is that limit. So it is going to try and encourage you not to put kind of everything into two change ideas or two drivers, but to actually kind of break that out into into smaller sort of bite sized drivers or bite sized ideas, basically. So there is some some limitation there. Um, I guess while we're here, the other one, another thing to add is kind of just adding another driver. So if I decided that I want to kind of add another one into the mix here, if I click, say, I want to add a change idea that comes off this secondary driver, then it's all of these little plus symbols that appear on the right hand side are where you would add something and it'll always kind of add to the right, basically. So I click that. Um, it's going to add another one on. It's taking me up and down the page a little bit there. Um, so say it's now created another change idea and it's done a little bit of shuffling. So this can be my new. 
idea and I can choose the color of that I want to make that um, so that one's already in progress I think so just simply just kind of add that um, so it's fairly straightforward to add them it's always building kind of left the right click that plus symbol and it will find the relevant space and put that black box there and you can then type in that set the color Another useful feature to think about once we've just added this one, let's just say our, our new idea isn't just related to support services that we've kind of drawn it from, but actually it relates to new devices and techniques. If I want to draw an extra line, then that's what this pin symbol is for, basically. So if I now want to basically connect um, the, the idea up to this, I need to click the pin symbol, and then it allows me to both remove the connection here and add a connection to other drivers. So in the fact that I've clicked the pin there, if I then click a pin over here, it will, as you see very quickly, it just drew that line there. So it's kind of allowing me to connect from right to left as well, should I need to do that. Well, you always have to add from one driver, but you can then retrospectively kind of connect up to other drivers basically. Um, okay, so just a quick question. Um, can you save this as a PDF to add to a report? Yep, let's go back up. So we just click save and made a bunch of changes there. There's a couple of options in terms of, kind of exporting it or including it in reports. First of all, the actions button at the top here, if I click that, I've got an option which is just export driver diagram which isn't a PDF, it's an image file. So it'll give you a, a PNG image file. Um, not everything on this on the page, but it'll basically give you everything inside the driver diagram box. It will take a picture of, of that driver diagram, yeah, as an image file. So that's nice and easy to include in a report or in a presentation, etc. The other option you've got is reports, which tend to be sort of broader than just the driver diagram. Um, so if I click reports, and you'll see a list of different report templates. Your list won't look the same as mine, but the, you'll see the templates that you have access to. Now, depending on how your organization set up those templates, it may or may not include the driver diagram, but a report tends to be broader than just a chart or a driver diagram. It tends to be, you know, everything in the project or the driver diagram and all the charts and the PDSA sort of thing. So yeah, if you just want the driver diagram for a report, then I would recommend um, purely using that export driver diagram uh, function, basically. One thing to note, is these driver diagrams can get pretty tall. So when it takes an image of that, um, you might have to kind of shrink that down um, uh, to, to fit, include it in your presentation. So depending on how tall your driver diagram becomes will affect the legibility when you try and squash it into uh, a small presentation or something like that. So it's kind of worth being, being aware of that. Um, but yeah, that's how you'd get that out. Uh, what else have we got whilst we're here? So history is another important one. Um, over the course of a QI project, the first version of the driver diagram is rarely sort of the last version that you end up with. So you can look back at the history and the changes of that if I click this history button here. Take a second to load up, but it's going to give me kind of the essentially like the audit log of, of changes. So you can see a few minutes ago, I made a change to it. Prior to that, it was also me four days ago, I made a change to it and Sophie's made some changes to it. I've made other changes to it. If I wanted to go back in time, if I can click on kind of the Andrew version of that, and it you might have seen it just jump slightly, it's changed the driver diagram slightly, so I can look back at an older version of that. Um, and it'll actually, do won't allow me to edit any of the old versions. This is just a, essentially a picture of the old driver diagram, but I can kind of look back at historical versions and see who changed it and when they changed it. And, and even as I said, what it looked like when they changed it, basically. So that's kind of a, a useful, uh, log of what's happened over time basically so yeah that is um a fairly quick run through but kind of diving into some of the more details around the driver diagram and what's possible as i said some of the features that aren't always immediately obvious and not used straight away are certainly the colors um defining those down the bottom and i guess just a reminder that when you first go to apply the colors you have to go to the bottom of the page and click manage colors before you can actually apply any colors, you kind of have to set the colors up and then they become um, become available for the driver diagram to use. So I'd certainly recommend having a play around with that if you haven't done that before. Um, and it's not like you mess it up, you can go and remove those colors and kind of set them back to, to another color um, if you just want to kind of have a play around with it. But yeah, that's a, that's a good feature, making sure this is on manual ordering and then dragging and dropping the drivers up and down is another feature that, that most people don't use sort of straight away. Um, 
the history, it's always useful to go in and have a look at the history and see how much your driver diagrams changed. If you, particularly if you're working on this as a team, um, you might be surprised how many people have kind of come in and, and kind of made changes over time. So certainly have a look at that. And as, as we just explored a minute ago, kind of exporting from there as well as another kind of key feature from the driver diagram. Um, okay, if we just sort of take a, a pause for a second there, I guess. So coming back to the agenda over the driver diagrams, um, some of the best practices there were definitely the, the kind of the color side of things and the manual ordering. Um, not going to drive dive really into kind of, I guess the theory around driver diagrams and, and how they should best be used too much. It's, this is more about that functionality basically. Um, um, but yeah, hopefully that's been useful. Any questions? Uh, sorry, uh, just Karen? one quick question. Yeah, um, there's uh, somebody that's new to driver diagrams. Um, could you just explain the difference between the primary drivers and secondary drivers? Um, sure. So, so the if you like reading the diagram, you'd kind of read it from left to right. So everything kind of hangs off the aim statement, if you like. So the idea is this is our overall aim of the project, and then we want to understand what are the what are the primary things that are like the big sort of ticket items that would affect our ability to hit this aim. Um, the example that I seem to come across most, and certainly the way I was taught it, is if you're thinking about if we forget this aim, but we're thinking about an aim of a, maybe a personal project around like sort of personal weight loss sort of thing, then what are the things that affect your weight? It tends to be calories in versus calories out. So what are the, the primary drivers in a, in a kind of a weight loss or weight management project might be, yeah, calories in, calories out. And that and then it helps you to think about, okay, well, what affects calories in? They become our secondary drivers, all the sort of smaller things that we can do to affect the amount of calories we take in, like how much we eat, how frequently we eat, what type of food that we eat, that sort of thing. Whereas then the secondary drivers that come off calories out, kind of calories burned, that's more than about, you know, how active we are, exercise, type of exercise, frequency of exercise, volume of exercise, all of those sorts of things. So that's that's always the example that stuck with me is what are those, the normally quite a small number of big ticket items that would be your primary drivers that, that are quite high level. And then you break them down into a bit more detail in the secondary level. And it's then from these secondary drivers that you can actually start to come up with ideas for change. Now, what are the reasonably small things that we could we could change and we could try and we could experiment with and then it'd be off those that you would then define the pdsa cycle so the really small kind of um discrete sort of tests of change um but yeah i guess in terms of best practice then probably shouldn't be too many primary drivers you don't often see more than maybe five at, at sort of the at the most um i'm not sure there are any hard and fast rules around that but certainly you can limit this to to a smaller number then it just kind of helps with the thinking and helps with the logic basically and very much the idea being rather than just coming up with a list of ideas and hoping that they connect into that aim statement is actually this is meant to show you some kind of like a logic model or if i change this does this idea in any way relate to the things that will affect my my aim statements that's kind of the idea Cool. Is that, do you think that answers it? Hopefully that answers it. Yeah, that's great. Yep. Thank that's you. That's about the limit of my understanding on that. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's perfect. Okay, flip back to the agenda. Um, yeah, so well, examples of driver diagrams, the one we've been looking at here is all around our, our standard kind of demo project, if you like, is around uh, pressure source. So yeah, these is this. I think this was based on a real driver diagram that's been used. Certainly don't take this as as one to exactly copy because it's been kind of manipulated and updated over time. Um, but yeah, in terms of best practice, it's probably a reasonable example in the sense of we have only three primary drivers. We've broken each of those primaries into sort of two to three secondaries. And then from there, we've been able to flow out the I change ideas from there. Um, so I don't think we're gonna go into, into too much more detail than that, basically. We sort of shift the focus now onto to the second area, which is PDSAs. Um, We've kind of grouped together driver diagrams and PDSAs in this session because the two are so closely kind of related. The idea, at least the way I've been taught about uh, QI, is that you should really start with the driver diagram before you dive into creating a whole series of PDSA cycles. Start with this, essentially this logic model and this aim statement and mapping out kind of increasing levels of detail What are, until you get to this point where you've got some change ideas. And then it's from then from those rather that you would start to come up with the PDSA cycles. Um, there is a particular view of the PDSAs we can get to from here, but I'm gonna um, come back to that later. 
I'm just going to open up. So PDSAs is one of the other pages or other tabs that we have on the project. So clicking on that, I'm just going to open that up in another tab. You're almost still in this pressure source project. So this is already fairly well populated. When you first come to this page, if you don't have any, then, then this list will be blank. And you're basically just greeted with this new PDSA ramp button up here. But once you have built some out, you'll start to see them appear on the page like this. And right, a few things to explain here. So each of these kind of boxes or rows is basically represents a PDSA ramp. And then within that ramp, you have a number of cycles. Um, not everyone's familiar with the PDSA ramp terminology. Essentially, it's kind of a collection of related PDSA cycles. The idea being, you know, you might run, you know, it could be dozens of PDSA cycles over the course of your project, but they're not all going to be completely different ideas. Some will be completely different, but others will be very much kind of related and sort of iterations of an original idea. The idea is the ramp. So this ramp, for example, is all around the introduction of new beds. And so far we've run three PDSA circles. We've been trying to experiment with introducing new beds, maybe playing around with what type of bed, how do we introduce that all on the theme of introducing new beds. And it might take us three, four, five, six PDSAs before we've really demonstrated that introducing new beds has made a difference in this case. Whereas the one we've got down here about providing patients with more information about pressure sores, that's a completely different idea. So it's a completely different ramp. And yes, we've got several cycles, but we kind of want to keep them organized separately. So that's a whole different ramp, basically. The other reason for laying them out as we do kind of in these sort of discrete rows is we're able to associate each of these ramps with one of our change ideas. So we can see this is actually one of our change ideas back from our driver diagram. And when I create a new PDSA ramp and PDSA cycle, I can link it back to my to one of my change ideas. And it just helps keep the project nice and organized. It helps provide some traceability so that I can see, you know, am I am I actually running any PDSAs against specific change ideas or have I kind of left them or missed them basically? Um, so yeah, we've got that traceability here. And that's also I wanted to keep this page open because if I then go back um, into here and actually in the change idea column, if I click on introduce new beds allow me to open this up and see um, that I can kind of introduce some new PDSA ramps from here, kind of have a look at this change idea in a bit more detail, as well as the information about that particular um, change idea. I'll be able to see if there are a whole bunch of PDSA ramps kind of listed here and even create one from here if I wish to do so. Ordinarily, this is going to be the page where you would create those. So let's have a look at one that's already completed first, and then we'll just have a step through of, of how to build a new one. So click into this. So this has opened up this particular sort of PDSA cycle. I can see that this cycle is two of two. So you can see that from the little icons as well. So I've got a ramp that's got two cycles in it. What it's currently showing me is the latest cycle. So it'll always open on the latest cycle. And within that, I can see both the PDSA form or I can flip into the task area as well. I'll show you that in a minute. Before I do that, just kind of go back and show you how to access the first cycle. So even though I'm working on the second one at the moment, if I wanted to go back to the first version, just double check something, then I go to this actions area over here, and that would then allow me to click on previous cycles and see any, any of the earlier cycles. There's only one earlier cycle in this case, but you know you might have a PDSA ramp that's got six or seven or 12 kind of previous cycles. So you can go back through those. But as I say, you're always going to be immediately presented with the latest one. The PDSA form is fairly straightforward. To be honest, there's nothing particularly um, revolutionary to kind of show you here. Most of it is kind of free text fields that you would fill out when you first create it. And we'll see that process in a minute. Here is where you'd make that link to the change idea. So um, that's, that would be a drop down field that would allow you to see all of your change ideas from your driver diagram and kind of select the one that's relevant. And these are kind of free text fields. Um, we've got a section here, which is which you don't see on every PDSA form, but this is allowing you to link back to all, some of your measures. So if I then link a measure here, it'll pull up the list of measures that I have for this project. So I can click on one of those, click link measure, and that will now kind of appear in the row down here in a second. So you can see I've now made a link between ED attendances and this particular PDSA cycle. And I can do that for as many uh, measures as, as I wish. Section you have down at the bottom here then is, you know, with the plan bit was all everything at the top. We've now got that do study act section that pops up and it's basically these sort of three uh, reasonably straightforward, but not always uh, easy to answer questions basically. 
Um, and if you're not quite sure what you should be writing, what do we mean by do, these little information icons on the right hand side, um, if you click on those, they'll give you a little extra hints and tips about what you should be writing, the sorts of things that you should be writing in each of those fields. That's kind of useful. A bit like we saw on the driver diagram page, I can't sort of accidentally make any changes to this. I need to click the edit button if I want to come in and, um, and update anything that's written in here. So I want to add some gobbledygook there, need to um, kind of come, come in and click that. Um, edit button and then either commit those changes by clicking save or cancel out of that. Get rid of my gobbledygook. The nice little hint we've got down here now at the bottom of that form is just new cycle. So if I've decided that I need to kind of iterate a bit further, I need to adapt this PDSA cycle. It kind of worked, but it didn't really work. I reckon we could do better. Then you click new cycle and it will create a new cycle that's also part of this PDSA ramp. So it's still going to relate it to the same change idea. Um, and it will copy in some of that planning information and just allow me to sort of update that plan and kind of begin to build that out. So it's definitely sort of good practice if you are looking to iterate or adapt from this cycle to go straight into that and start planning that out and kind of just have captured at least the basics of, of the next version of the PDSA cycle. But just, just clarify something I said a moment ago, if you are looking to now create a totally different PDSA cycle, like this idea was a waste of time, really didn't work the new cycle down here, that's not the button you want to click, because I said this is going to create a PDSA cycle within the same ramp, the same change idea. If you've got a totally different idea, then we need to go back up to the main PDSA page and create it from there. And we'll do that in a minute. Um, but the last thing I wanted to show you in this space was the tasks area. So remember, we're still in our out of bed three times a day PDSA cycle. And the PDSA tab there, that was the that was kind of the the planning, the kind of the page, the notes, all of that information. The tasks area we've opened up here are tasks specific to this PDSA cycle. Um, and it just allows me to break things down into a bit more detail. Now, not everyone uses this, not every PDSA cycle needs a breakdown down sort of task list, has a whole lot of people involved in it. But if it does, then you've got this area that you can make use of. There's some basic uh, kind of when, who, where planning information that you can capture here. Um, kind of who's responsible for the PDSA cycle, where is it taking place, all that sort of stuff. But the key thing over here is then the task list. So you can see within each of these, you can give a task description, you can assign it to someone, where is it happening, you can give it a due date, and then team can kind of come in here and, and tick off their task as they work through those. I want to add a task to that list, click that task, and you get this short little wizard. Um, got to give it a title, provide some notes, particularly if you're going to assign it to someone else, then notes on what to do. Um, when you click into the list, it's going to show you the list of all the team members that you've got in your project. So if you find that you want to try and assign this to someone who's not on that list, then you're going to need to go back to the team area over here um, and basically make sure that they're invited to that project. Um, and then they'll become available kind of within that list. And then you can set yeah, a due date and you can type a uh, location as well save and that's now added that to the list basically and it will put them in in kind of date order as well um so yeah and then as the team come in if they want to complete their task they just click that little tech, tech check box there and it'll kind of tick that off for them basically so it's super handy if you've got a pdsa cycle that's that's fairly detailed um, sorry just a quick question jace um is there a way to show all tasks from a pdsa cycle um, I suppose this way, well, yeah, when you're in a PDSA cycle, because this is one of the cycles, this is the view that would list out all of those tasks for this specific cycle. Uh, and this would also be included if you ran off a report that included the full kind of PDSA section within the report, it would include the tasks as well. If you wanted to get a view of all tasks across all PDSA cycles on the project, then I think, again, that would be there isn't a single view for that in the system, but the one of the report options, if it, as if it was listing out all the PDSAs, it would show you all the PDSA information, including all the tasks for all of the PDSAs. So that would be the way to get to get to that information. Um, but yeah, if you just wanted this view, it only gives you kind of PDSA by PDSA. So I'd have to go to one of my other PDSAs to see the other tasks that are that are open. Great, thank you. Sure. Right, we come back up here. So this was that sort of top P 
PDSA page as well. I had a list of the, all of those out there. I'm just going to show you through the process quickly of, of creating a new PDSA ramp and a new PDSA cycle. So you can see we've got this sort of four step kind of wizard that uh, or setup guide that's going to take us through. And this is going to really just kind of do the, the planning stage of the PDSA cycle. It's just to capture that those initial bits of information. So one of the only mandatory fields, and we can see it's mandatory because it's bright red, standard sort of um, highlighting there. And it obviously says it's a required field as well. So purpose of this new PDSA cycle. First thing is what's this PDSA cycle going to be called? Um, give it a more helpful title than that, but I don't have one pretty prepared. So I'm just going to call it PDSA cycle number 67. Um, the aim of the PDSA cycle, and again, I mentioned earlier, but these little information icons that will appear here, if you click on that, it'll give you a bit more information on, on how to fill out that aim. But obviously, what is the aim of this specific PDSA cycle? Again, mentioned earlier, change idea. So this little, little arrow shows this as a drop down field. So if I click into that, it's going to give me a list of all of my PDSA, uh, sorry, all of my change ideas. Um, and there's that new idea, the one that I created earlier. So I'm saying, yep, I'm going to link this. PDSA cycle to that particular change idea because they're kind of related. So yeah, make that linkage. Um, it's worth pointing out the fact I didn't write a name in there. I can do that later. It's not a mandatory field, so I can skip past that if I wish to do so. Who's responsible for this PDSA cycle? I'm going to take this one on. Um, yeah, happy with that date. And that one's going to happen at HQ as well. So click through that. Particularly useful if you if this is for someone else or other people are going to be involved is provide a bit more of an overview, provide some notes, a bit more information on kind of what's going to be happening or what you think is going to, how it needs to go down. Task area as well, we had a look at those a minute ago, but if you want to preload some tasks into this, um, you know, you don't have to wait till later until the PDSA is created, you can start adding the tasks directly in here um, and clicking on that will give you that little same little task window that we saw a moment ago, just allow you to do that. Um, and then key part of the kind of the PDSA uh, methodology is then make your prediction. I often find this is the useful bit because you've kind of come up with your plan, forces you to think through what's actually, what do you actually think is going to happen? And then you realize that your plan probably isn't all that good. And you could go back and kind of add certain elements to that or try and mitigate some of the risks. So definitely recommend filling this out, or at least thinking in detail about what do you think is actually going to happen when you, when you put this plan into action. And then last but not least, linking the measures. And we saw this on the full PDSA form, but again, you've got an opportunity here as kind of part of that plan is have you already got any measures defined that you can associate with this PDSA cycle? If you click that, it will give you the same sort of little drop down list. So again, I can click relate this one to ED attendances if I wish to do so. Um, so that linkage is now going to be made there. Again, I can repeat that. So if there are a bunch of measures that you need to associate with this, um, you can link as many as you need to and then click create, create PDSA cycle. So that's save that now. That's now registered on the system. Um, PDSA cycle is number 67, cycle you know one of one. Um, so if I go to the bottom of the page and click new cycle, I'll be able to create kind of you know, version two of this one. Um, but all the information that I've captured now is here in this planning section. If I want to come in and make some changes, maybe add my aim statement, click A, click edit, fill that out and go back and click save. All that information's there. The measure that I linked in is there, nice and obviously. Um, but then the area that's now available for me is the Do Study Act area. So yeah, that wasn't there when we first set it up. But now that we've planned it out, ideally we've kind of obviously tested out that PDSA cycle, so come back, and these fields become available. So as we did earlier, click Edit. You can fill those out. Click Save, and all that information is captured. And then when you're ready to kind of create potentially create version two of this, click New Cycle. And it will spin up that that latest PDSA cycle for me. Okay, let's pop back up to the PDSA list. I'm just going to jump back into the agenda as well, just to check how we're getting on. Um, best practice in creating PDSAs. Some examples. Oh, yeah, I guess probably not going to dive into the to the examples. I don't think we have any any uh, excellent examples ready for you today. But yeah, hopefully that's given you a decent run through of kind of the main steps, if you like, within the PDSA cycle space. Um, in terms of best practices, um, just kind of sort of touch on a few things we've we've already been over, but uh, partly it's the way you organize them. So I think this idea of understanding kind of ramps and cycles and how they were and linking them into your change ideas. So you don't just have 
a very long list of uh, rows here that have only got one cycle trying to think that through so okay we've got a theme here like introduction of new beds and creating a, a range of cycles that, that kind of iterate and iterate through that until you get to that process to that to that point where you've kind of proven something or you're happy to abandon it and actually being able to see that uh, nicely organized on this page i think is very important because this might seem like a, a silly point to make but the other thing in terms of pdsa cycles is sometimes we we find that you've got a project that its progress score is doing really well the charts are looking really good it's demonstrating improvement but there either aren't any pdsa cycles in life qi or the ones that are there seem to be quite out of date so it's partly just a best practice in terms of encouraging yourself or encouraging the team that are working on the project to make sure they are logging as many of the PDSA cycles as possible and that they are completing as many of the fields as possible. Um, it's just, it kind of forces that little bit of discipline and that little bit of consistency around kind of the improvement methodology. The more you think about those, each of those questions or each of those fields, like the prediction field, the better you tend to define those PDSA cycles, the better defined they are, the more successful they're likely to be. So it's the fields aren't there for our sake, they're there for your sake, and they're kind of very much built around the IHI PDSA form. So the more closely teams can and thoroughly they can follow that, the more likely they are to kind of succeed with these tests of change. So I very much recommend being as consistent and thorough as possible in the incompletion of this area of the project, basically. And then perhaps last but not least mentioned, you know, maybe you've got a project that, um, you know, is doing well, the charts are looking good, they're demonstrating improvement, you've got a whole series of PDSA ramps and cycles, you know, this is looking good, then it's making sure that, that you or the team reflect that in this progress score. So if you go back onto the project general page, you've got this change score here. Um, this is another part of the kind of IHI methodology that we've built in. So this is the IHI's project progress score scale. It's on every project in the system. Every project would start out automatically as a 0 0.5, but it's up to it's up to the team, the project team, to update the score as they move through that life cycle. And it's very much a case of clicking on the score that is relevant to, to where you're at in the project. Um, you know, each of these have standard titles, standard definitions, and it's a case of it's slightly subjective in, in some cases, but it's it's up to you to kind of assess where are you against these different markers, basically. So, you know, project goals of 50% or more complete, for example, for significant improvement or, or a bit more substantial when it comes to sustainable improvement. So the more you keep this up to date, the more that kind of your organization is going to be able to understand where your project's got to in that life cycle, particularly as this is almost like one of the primary, if not the primary kind of marker when they're looking across dozens or hundreds of projects to understand how, is that project delivering improvement yet or which projects are delivering improvement if you're assessing a dozen of them or so but people don't have the time to go through all the charts they can understand this progress score from some of the analytics dashboards and that will then lead them to either query your project or, or not query your project as well depending on the, the score and how long the project's been running and things like that but often one of the the kind of the tests that the qi teams do is looking at some of these dashboards, they can see what that score is, but they can also see at a glance how many charts and how many PDSA cycles there are in some of these reports. So if your score is 4.5, but you've got zero PDSA cycles and only one chart, it kind of doesn't really stack up in terms of what you'd expect from a project. So that's partly why there's this kind of be consistent and be thorough around not just the charting, but around the PDSA cycles as well. Um, sorry, Jace, just uh, one more quick yep. question. Um, uh, it's come in just asking about um, demo projects and perhaps um, if we haven't already got any demo projects, it might be handy to have some demo projects for people to understand the PDSAs and driver diagrams. Um, I know that we do have demo projects that obviously we use for demo purposes. I was just wondering if there's anything that we currently have that people can refer to other than the help centre or if it is something that perhaps we're thinking about doing um, in the longer term to provide that kind of demo project as you come in to give you an idea of what, what you could potentially, what it could look like, I guess. Sure. Yeah, because there's a few parts to that. So we do have, we do now have a example project in the system so that when a new user joins the platform, kind of not, not really from the understanding the theory of PDSAs and drivers and that sort of thing, but just kind of more understanding how the system looks and works. There is now an example project that, all new users can go and have a look at and there are some in-app guides that will pop up to kind of offer them that opportunity 
Um, but in terms of ongoing beyond that, um, we don't really have any any or many sort of example projects kind of pre-populated in the system. And the reason we don't is that a lot of organizations want to do their own versions of that. Um, the, the subject matter that we might come up with might not be appropriate. Uh, people might want to teach it in slightly different ways, those sorts of things. So some organizations have their own example projects. And as they're training their staff in QI and or live QI, they will often point their staff at those example projects. And I think that can be potentially more helpful for staff if, because it's kind of been done and led by, by the different, their, you know, their own QI team rather than just us and the examples that we might come up with. Um, so yeah, that's the reason we've kind of steered away from that for the most part, other than that initial example that, that a brand new user can be pointed at basically. No worries at all. Thank you for that. Uh, just uh, one other quick question that's come in. Do team members get notified when someone makes changes to the project? No, for the most part, no. If you someone changes the progress score, you tend to get notified by that. But if someone just adds a measure or updates a chart, something kind of uh, relatively small like that, you don't get notified. You can, when you next log in, if you go to this sort of the, the timeline over here, which I think that looks like bullet points, that will give you this sort of audit trailer of what's happened, but it won't notify you every time someone makes one of these changes, uh, mainly because you could be fairly inundated if someone comes in and creates three measures and two PDSA cycles and updates the driver diagram, you could be really inundated with notifications. So we've kind of stepped back from that. You'll get notified if someone create or like invites you to a project or does something more significant, like change the progress score, but not some of the, the smaller changes. But as I say, if you click on this, you can then see the list of, of key changes that have taken place. And you can see, and by hovering, who's done it, when they did it, and what they did. So PDSA has been added, status update has been left, and measures has been added, those sorts of things. So you can come in and kind of review that yourself. But yeah, you won't, just won't be alerted, basically. OK, I think we're about up on time. Yeah. To hang on if there are any more questions. Uh, the last sort of final piece I'd say is the help center so pretty much everything we've covered is in the help center so help.lifeqisystem.com covers all the areas of the platform and kind of all the how-to articles so there's a section on driver diagrams section on pdsa cycles and you can go in here and there are even more sort of detailed um uh, articles and videos as well so click on one at random but creating a pdsa ramp there's probably a video in here yeah there's a Two and a half minute video someone guiding you through some of what we've looked at today as well as the step-by-step -step guide so definitely recommend heading over to help.lifeqisystem.com for that um, and you'll also find links to that uh, kind of at the top of the web pages as well the top of the system you'll find the relevant link to the relevant part of the help center um, great um, sure to get there. just to let everybody know um i've popped that link into the chat area so if you did want to have a look at that uh, that web page in the help area that's already up and also there is another web page that's really useful um, that has general information about pdsas there's quite a few blog blog articles in there so i've also popped that in the chat so feel free to to have a look at that great perfect I think, I think that's it then lovely thank you everyone great thank you for attending today have a great day and uh, catch you all soon <laughs>